fighting in Ukraine concentrates in one area in the east where thousands of troops are said to be surrounded by anti-government forces. A year ago, peaceful protests in Kiev turned deadly. We remember the events that brought chaos and death to Ukraine. Plus, Greece is almost out of time to agree on a bailout extension with previous failed talks. It's just gone midday in the Russian capital. Welcome to RT International. Fighting in the east of Ukraine has shrunk to one area only where the war is still raging despite the ceasefire. It's the town of Debaltseva on the border between the two self-proclaimed republics. You can see just here in the middle there. Um, it's turned into a fierce battle zone now. Now, the front line here uh, creates a pocket, as you can see, where anti-government forces claim to have surrounded thousands of Ukrainian troops. Ukrainian military deny they're fully encircled, though. International monitors and Kiev say attacks on Debaltsevar are a direct violation of the Minsk peace deal, while anti-government leaders say they're acting in compliance with the peace deal. They claim they've completely encircled the town and inside their territory. Well, our correspondent Marad Gaziev, he's in the area and he joins us live now. Hi Marad, good to see you. What is the situation there then? Because we are getting reports that the government troops are surrendering. It is, it is still volatile. Much of the city, uh, more than half of it, is under the control uh, of anti-government forces. They are pressing to close the pocket, to close uh, that pocket and force the uh, remaining uh, Ukrainian troops, thousands of them apparently, uh, to surrender. They say anyone who is willing to lay down their, uh, their weapons will be allowed to leave unharmed. Any prisoners of war taken uh, will be treated with respect and courtesy. Uh, but the fighting there still is con continuing and uh, hundreds of Ukrainian troops are apparently uh, choosing to lay down their arms uh, and surrender instead. The officers and the commanders of the Ukrainian military have apparently, according to anti-government forces, abandoned uh, abandoned the forces inside that pocket which uh, tremendously demoralized their uh, low in ammunition uh, low on food and they're saying that uh, soon the fighting there will die away but uh, Vladimir Putin has said that he hopes the Ukrainian uh, government and the Ukrainian military uh, don't persecute those soldiers who choose to lay down their arms and surrender to save their lives in such a uh, desperate uh, situation. Uh, across the front, though, as you mentioned, uh, it's very, very quiet. There has be, there've been no significant uh, attacks or uh, military, uh, military action along those front lines. And uh, in fact, tonight, uh, over the course of tonight, the anti-government forces say uh, that there have been no registered Ukrainian artillery shelling attacks on, uh, on anti-government eastern uh, territory, which is a, a first, uh, definitely, and that bodes very well for the ceasefire, as uh, it calls for a complete, uh, complete halt to hostilities. Uh, the uh, Nova Russian, the anti-government forces, also say that they've begun pulling back their forces. Uh, some of their heavy artillery is ready uh, to be taken away from the front lines, which is the second point of the Minsk agreement: the withdrawal uh, of heavy weapons but uh, life here is continuing and uh, I must say that uh, people there are more people out in the streets here in Donetsk for example though these people have been under shelling uh, constant threat of shelling for months now it's been like a lottery going outside you know uh, you never know where a shell is going to go so while you know they are breathing out uh, in relief the people uh, left here they're, they're the hardiest uh, of the lot Indeed, Marad, thank you so much for updating us there in the epicentre of it all. Thank you. Now, the UN Security Council has shown unity on Ukraine, voting unanimously to support a ceasefire. The resolution was 
proposed by Russia. It calls for all sides to comply with the Minsk peace deal, which includes a bilateral ceasefire and the withdrawal of heavy artillery from the front line. It also allows access of humanitarian aid to the embattled areas and constitutional reform. But despite all members passing the vote, accusations were still flying. You could stop arming the separatists, stop sending hundreds of heavy weapons across the border in addition to uh, your troops, uh, stop pretending you are not doing what you are doing. We are not pretending. We propose a certain course of actions. You are not listening to us. We warned about the consequences. We can't agree with um, uh, such interpretation of uh, the Minsk agreements as it was sounded from the Russian side. The members of the UNSC continued to provoke me. We are not interpreting anything. We take the Minsk agreement word for word and we think everyone should read the document in such a manner. The CNN News Network has mistakenly shown Ukraine as being annexed by the Russian Federation. Right now, European leaders are confronted by three very different but all potentially dire challenges and all seem to be heading towards a critical point. Well, the channel also interviewed the former NATO Secretary General Ander Fo Rasmussen, who accused Russia of reviving its Soviet ambitions. RT's Peter Oliver has more on that story. The former NATO Secretary General Anders Fogh Rasmussen has been doing the rounds, portraying Moscow as the bogeyman in Eastern Europe. Here's what he had to say to CNN just recently. It's uh, part of a bigger master plan uh, to restore uh, a Russian zone of influence uh, in the near uh, neighborhood covering the former uh, Soviet space. Um, and therefore, uh, the Russians uh, want to keep their neighbors weak and dependent on Russia and prevent them uh, from seeking Euro-Atlantic integration uh, in the European Union and, and NATO. Well, it really is the era to be an Eastern European expert. It seems that media around the world will want your opinions on what's going on. And those opinions that we've seen coming out are that um, Moscow and that Russia wants a broader conflict within Eastern Europe, that guns and other weapons have to be supplied in order to nip Russian aggression in the bud. And, well, after Ukraine, where does Russian aggression go next? So these claims that Russia is wanting to try and expand its influence and to try and look for the next victim, if you will, after the situation in Ukraine calms down, well, it's all built on speculation and no hard evidence for these opinions has been provided. A year ago today, protests in central Kiev reached a point of no return. What started as a peaceful call for Euro integration grew into a violent and bloody uprising that eventually led the country into complete disarray. So this is the Maidan Square there, Kiev's iconic square. It's seen before the tragic events. And this is what it looked like during the revolution. Here, the Ukrainian capital's central streets during summer. Fast forward to winter, barricades and burning tires. Now a common sight. The unrest then spread to the east, bringing chaos and destruction. All of that in just a year, with thousands of lives lost. Arty's Yegor Piskanov, he looks at how it all started. Um, we have to warn you, there are some graphic footage in the following report. February 18th, 2014. Thousands of protesters march towards the national parliament in what's been dubbed a peace offensive, but it soon degenerates into clashes with police. Live rounds are reportedly fired by both sides. By day's end, at least 25 people are killed, including 10 policemen. The violence continues overnight. Wednesday, February 19th, tensions are high following the deadly events of the previous day, but the rioters stand their ground. Police checkpoints are set up across Kiev in a de facto state of emergency. Away from the capital, rioters loot a depot in western Ukraine, making off with more than a thousand guns. 
while a shaky truce is agreed between President Yanukovych and the leaders of three top opposition parties. February 20th, now known as Bloody Thursday, and the most violent day in Kiev since the Second World War. Gunfire breaks out again on the square, hitting both protesters and police. We now know some were shot by snipers from nearby buildings. And it's not clear who the shooters were and whose orders they were executing. Both sides still blame each other. The rioters managed to push the police off Maidan and back into nearby streets. It's thought nearly 100 people could have lost their lives that day alone. February 21st. After what they themselves call a night of difficult negotiations, the foreign ministers of France, Germany and Poland broker another peace deal. It sets early presidential elections in Ukraine and limits the powers of the head of state. But by the end of the day, radical rioters announced that truce or no truce, they are still willing to use force to make the president step down. The following night, Yanukovych flees the capital in fear of his life and shortly after, he's ousted from power. Igor Peskunov, RT.